Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. We're excited to have Sara Oliveira as the guest for today's episode. I'd like to give a special thanks for those who joined us in San Francisco earlier this year at the Cultured Meat Symposium. We had over 250 cell-based meat, future food tech, professionals, investors, and students at the event. Videos and audio from the panels will be released shortly, so stay tuned. Sara Oliveira is a biomedical engineer specializing in tissue engineering. Two years after her PhD, she decided to dive into a new adventure. Sara holds a PhD in bioengineering systems from the MIT Portugal program at the University of Minho, and she has a strong background in tissue engineering and biomaterials, such as multi-scale scaffold preparation, gelatin, cell isolation, culture differentiation, and characterization. In late 2016, the Food Processing and Nutrition Group at the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory, or INL, sought out a tissue engineer for a 3D printing and cultured meat project. Most of her time at the Food Processing and Nutrition Group has been dedicated to setting up the lab for food printing, assessing multi-scale food properties, project development, and several outreach activities. Currently, Sara explores 3D food bioprinting to develop tunable 3D beef and to study the texture and meat quality properties of future cell-cultured foods. Sara, I am excited to welcome you to the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. Hi, Alex. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Sara, you have a very interesting background when it comes to 3D printing of food and also the cultured meat space. Tell us how you got interested in future food and if you ever had that aha moment that made you want to jump into this journey. Yes, in fact, it was a little bit of an aha moment, but also a result of many circumstances. In 2015, I was doing a postdoctoral research on bioprinting for bone tissue engineering. And also, my first son was born. And many things had changed along the way. And one that was maybe one of the most important was my mindset that was changing, my concern with food, nutrition, new foods. And this was uh, basically because I needed to know what is best for my kids. And after being seven years doing research on tissue engineering, mostly at the University of Ming in Portugal, I felt I needed to refresh and expand my horizons. I was actively looking for opportunities and maybe my moment was when I found this 3D food printing and culinary technology position at INL. So I thought, okay, this is not my field, but uh, many biomaterials may be edible or work a little bit like food and 3D bioprinting has some similarities with uh, 3D food printing. I thought I could actually do this and at the interview they asked me if I thought it could be possible to do this, keeping cells alive. I found it, uh, I was a little bit confused with that. I answered yes, of course. And Honestly, I was not very familiar with the concept at the time, but I got fascinated with the culture meat and the first burger and the meatball I had been tasted around that time. For me, it was great. I could learn new things and expand my expertise too. In uh, November 2016, I joined the food processing group and nutrition at INL in Portugal. That is the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory. And most of the listeners may not know INL. We are kind of a unique institution in, in the world with an international character established by the Portuguese and Spanish governments as a interdisciplinary nanotechnology center of excellence. In summary, we work in the application of nanoscience and nanotechnology in the food processing and safety environment, ICT, uh, renewable energy and health. And in my group, we work on the improvement and creation of healthier food products with uh, 
eye functionality, texture and appearance. Like we work on food structure, edible and smart food packaging, bioactive for encapsulation and development of uh, gut ownership devices. For instance, we have solutions to reduce salt, reduce saturated fat, create edible coatings on foods to improve the shelf life and study the digestion and cytotoxicity of foods at the gut, gut level. And uh, 3D food bioprinting allow us to integrate all these technologies to produce personalized products. Products for people, for instance, with uh, dysphagia, diabetes, for children, and also culture meat. 3D printing and bioprinting is currently seen most in, in the medical field. And so when we're talking about 3D printing food, can you tell us exactly what that means? Sure. Yeah. 3D bioprinting is still too attached to tissue engineering, where uh, the goal is to make functional organs and tissues, we all know. On the other side, 3D printing, which is made without cells or biologics, is spreading everywhere. It's being used to make flexible and durable shoes, fashion clothes, solar panels. It's also used even for automated farming or to build uh, concrete houses. And around five to six years ago, it started also to be more noticed in the food technology area. And 3D food printing is based in the same principle of dispensing something, in this case, it is food layer by layer and according with the computer assisted to the design but this has to be done in food safe conditions what i usually explain in the um, outreach activities is that the 3d printed food is not more than food shaped with a different baser bag but that is more accurate than even the hands of a great baser chef and one of the first 3d food printers was a micro extrusion base that is the same type that works actually like a pastry bag and uh, was tested with a frosting, chocolate and Nutella. And this was more than 10 years ago. And the second most famous food printer is powder-based. Uh, here the food should be powder and is placed in a printing chamber. And what is dispensed is a liquid that binds the particles. It is used to create more complex food structures but uh, needs finishing to remove the powder, for instance, uh, from the pores. And for now, this technique is uh, promising, but uh, it has been mostly used uh, with sugar. And the third type is like a familiar desktop inkjet printer. It works with food with lower viscosity that can be more easily used, for instance, to decorate cookies. But today we can print, uh, in theory, we can print 3D food that look and is whatever we want with a plus that uh, we can create uh, 3D structures that cannot be easily made with uh, traditional techniques. Obviously, that depending on the machine, and on the printing technique, we have certain resolution limits. Also, certain geometries ask for supporting structures, like in the regular 3D printing, because there is no excuse for gravity. And, uh, for instance, works for products with a smooth surface, uh, but if we add, for instance, a polishing step in the end. And today we work with 3D foods, for instance, with mashed potato, meringue, insect diary, proteins, or even tempered chocolate. And they taste the same familiar flavor you remember. The printer does not change the flavor. It changes the shape and may change the texture. The printers for food are still in a stage that are evolving and are promising many things like what I already said, the personalized food regarding the nutrition the texture, the color, the shape, uh, new 3D designs with the common foods or adapted foods, new eating experience. is also a great technique to use more sustainable food ingredients that are usually powder-based and to make them more attractive foods. Also allied with uh, artificial intelligence can be in the future a real system for consumer food personalization in the moment. Or just a simple way to make your kid eat the greens with a smile on his face. <laughs> Something every parent would be happy about. Do you think that the 3D printers might be a large part of the future bakery or cake decorating shop? Yes, they can and they are already being. 
some uh, bakeries uh, already use, but mostly it's being seen in gourmet restaurants. Also, for instance, in an episode of MasterChef Australia. So moving on to clean meat. When we're talking about clean meat, cultured meat, there's a high cost of production. When we're looking at 3D printed foods, would that in the future lower the cost of production for different types of foods that have a high cost today? Yeah, the cost is mostly determined by the price of the machine and also the number of the structures that can be printed in a certain period of time and also obviously the, the consumables, but that's not that expensive. For now, a top bench printer can cost around 2,000 to 4,000 euros. But uh, with more people getting engaged and interested uh, with uh, production increasing and new developments, we expect to see these prices dropping. The same happened with the 3D printers using plastic filaments. I cannot say what would be the price and when the prices decrease, maybe it will be also the time where we want to produce higher quantities of these products because people will know better technology and will actually want the, the products. Regarding the production time, usually the time increases with the resolution, the size uh, and with the use of multiple foods in the same structure. Uh, what I'm going to say is very relative, but for instance, simple structure can take from seconds to few minutes, while a more complex and full dish can take uh, like uh, one hour. For large, large scale production, there are not many options to not say none yet. We are in a stage that every application demands uh, their own tailor-made machine. An industrial system needs to overcome the, the eventual production time issue, for instance, using uh, parallel printing ads or having multiple printers running at the same time. Big companies like uh, Barilla or Hershey are interested and are exploring the technology. Three years ago, printing pasta was taking minutes. And uh, recently, I read that uh, at Barilla restaurants in, in New York, you can get your own letter-shaped pasta dish for $15, maybe since last year. The most exciting that is that the whole meal takes around 30 seconds to be printed. It seems they reduce the grams of pasta per dish to 80 grams, but uh, still, it is a very good printing time. Some restaurants are already using 3D food printers to create gourmet and uh, new eating experience. Like uh, I was just saying, you could have watched in um, some weeks ago an episode of MasterChef Australia. Um, for common consumers, this is not yet kitchen appliance that they can immediately afford, but maybe in five to ten years it might be. Maybe we can see 3D printed chocolate and pasta soon on the supermarket shelf or our favorite pastry shop uh, actually personalized our birthday cake with this. So right now you had mentioned a couple examples where 3D printed foods are restaurants. Are there any products on store shelves that come from 3D printed technology today? Yes, there are um, some 3D food products and as I said, some restaurants also using 3D printers. So for instance, uh, you can order 3D Belgian chocolates with any shape or uh, get a healthy 3D gummy with the shape and flavor you have chosen at your home. At least these two small companies are from Europe. Um, a couple of companies provide uh, 3D food printers that anyone may buy and some also provide food cartridges already filled, for instance with a marzipan or chocolate. Other alternative way to have access to 3D food products is by actually making them. The printers in the market are so different that you can print in expert mode or almost be unfamiliar with the technique. The easiest mode is where you follow the recipe for the dish you have chosen in the gallery. You prepare the food or buy a filled cartridge. You fill and press print and after some minutes your food is ready. In the case 
you want to start learning more in deep, a common mashed potato or cream cheese or butter are the easy way to start. They have um, a good viscosity and can be used at room temperature. Or you can just pick some food you want to try and start adjusting the printability. The food can be easily printable. You just think to have it as an homogeneous paste with enough viscosity. For instance, if you extrude it with a syringe, it makes an homogeneous filament that keeps its shape. You do this with common fruit ingredients like adding uh, gelatin or, or starch, other fresh fruits or, or simply normal cooking like reducing the water to increase the viscosity. Then you also need a design. You can create it using open access CAD software or download something you like from databases like Tinkercad or Tinkiverse is all open access. Then you use a slicing software. They are open access too, or there are some, to convert design and the printing settings to the code that the machine actually understands, that is the G-code. In some printers, you, you may not need to care about this because they have their own software incorporated. In the future, the printers may recognize us, may collect our relevant medical data and our daily fitness information. And with that, they they may suggest and prepare us uh, 3D foods according with our real needs. For traditional 3D printers, I know there's a lot of like open source projects where they show you how to build like a 3D printer from the mechanical engineering aspect. Have you heard of anything like that for 3D printers for food? I think there was a page that I don't remember very well the name, if it was uh, Cooking 3D Chefs or something. They were sharing information about printers and uh, some uh, recipes. I'm not sure if it is updated today, but usually the companies providing the 3D food printers are already sharing several uh, 3D designs and recipes. I think in future they also want that the consumers can make their own 3D designs and recipes and, and share among them. So they expect to have this kind of communities going on more. So let's talk about 3D printing for clean meat. How can we use 3D printing for clean meat production? For example, will we 3D print cells? Will we be 3D printing scaffold? And where would we get the materials? We may use it in many things. It might contribute in any step of the way where the geometry or special position is important. It can be useful to produce a prototype or a mold or to create the actual meat texture by controlling the composition of the cell-based meat in each filament that is dispensed, each layer created and defined in 3D design. Printing edible scaffolds or bioprinting cells in edible bioinks are two of the alternatives. We can play with the architecture and content of adipose tissues in the meat or simultaneously Simultaneously, we can build in structures for oxygen and metabolite exchange to deliver the nutrients to the cells. This is very important during the cell culture and cell maturation periods. And as far as I know, also 3D bioprinted muscle tissue for medical applications is at the basic research level. The tissues are yet very thin for what we want for meat. Most uh, recent studies might have been around 1 to 2 millimeters, that was 7 to 9 layers. And they used bioinks with uh, some not all compounds that I don't think they are so edible, like photocurable materials, fibrinogen, polyethylene glycol. They also use the alginate that comes from algae. Um, while in one study, the fusion of the myoblast was limited, in the other, a larger uh, fraction of the myotubes was, was around 0.3 to 0.4 millimeters in length. This was after 15 days in culture. But here for meat, we might need a little bit more. Like, I would say, the full thickness of a steak to get that long fiber characteristic texture. Going back to the possible uses, as I said, we can 3D print a cellular scaffolds or 
3D structures to guide the growth of the cells, which would uh, be added in a step later on. And this approach increases the range of edible materials that can be used. However, on the other side, also might become more difficult to achieve the long aligned and uh, mature myotubes. I also believe in a more futuristic uh, scenario and use for the 3D printing for cell-based meats, like a scenario where we have culture and meat structuring, small-scale systems capable of uh, producing meat or fish just enough to feed the family, like something we could have uh, at our homes. There are some low-cost 3D printers on the market already for traditional 3D printing items. Do you think that in the future uh, we could have 3D food printers at home? And what would this really look like? Would it be more of an appliance that sits next to the microwave or would it look like something else? Yes. Today, most of the people are not ready to have a 3D food printer at home. They don't know enough about it yet or just don't know it at all. And also, it's still not for everyone's pocket. And most of people get fascinated when they see a food printer for the first time. But also, few people find it weird, unnatural, until we explain how it works, what's in the food capsules and for what it can be used for. And maybe in five to ten years, with prices decreasing and marketing, it may become a common kitchen appliance. Meanwhile, you can already have one at home, even if you're not familiar with 3D printing. These printers look like and have the size of a microwave or like a surface is smaller than a microwave with a robotic arm or with a frame. And some of them provide access to a database or a gallery with designs and recipes optimized by 3D food uh, printing experts and chefs. Or you can add your regular 3D printer for plastics um, simply using a syringe and a um, 3D printed syringe pump and a micro server and just be a 3D food maker. You're currently exploring 3D food bioprinting and, and to study the texture and meat quality properties of future cell cultured food. Can you tell us a little bit about what this project looks like and what you're hoping to achieve with it and if there are any exciting projects that you have planned for the future? Yes, at INL we are doing basic research on 3D food printing and bioprinting for culture meat. We basically want to know the limits and how with these techniques we can tailor, for instance, the texture, the juiciness and the tenderness of a cell-based beef steak. And our research is based on the principle of using only food-based bioinks and food byproduct when possible. A lot of work has to be done here and not forgetting that not all the bioinks used in tissue engineering uh, might be food grade, neither that the food safe limit amount of certain bioinks may in future be very small. I hope in three to four years we start having 3D meat samples with highly viable myotubes and fats as well as methodologies to screen several steps of the way that are important from the cell culture, the cell stimulation, the texture and the sensorial properties of the meat. We also might start working on development of 3D food printers more affordable for at least for our Portuguese um, community. You can follow Sara and some of the awesome future food content on Twitter at Sara M O L I V, and you could find Sara on LinkedIn. Sara, are there any last insights that you might want to share with our listeners today? Just in case you have interest, want to contribute to our work, do not hesitate in contacting me. Sara, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your story on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Podcast. Okay, thank you. This is your host, Alex, and we look forward to being with you on our next episode. Thanks for being a listener. Since we started the show, we've definitely learned a lot about cell-based meat, but also a lot about podcasting. We'd love to get your feedback, whether you have comments on the questions, the ads, audio quality, whatever it may be. Submit your feedback to futurefoodshow.com. Special thanks to all of our guests on the show. 
Julian Zvorsko for making the intro tune, Anita Brolux and Florine Schmidt for drafting the questions, Adrian Medea de Pura and Cyrus Manuran for editing, Yuri Kleben for outreach, Nick Talrea for legal counsel. And most importantly, thank you for listening and spreading the word about cell-based meat and future food technologies.